Namaste. I'm Johannes Bernwall and I'm here at Agile India with Arlo Belshi. So uh, Arlo is a, a very experienced trainer in extreme programming and agile practices and uh, he gave some uh, really interesting insights into uh, how to train teams on becoming agile at the conference. Mm -hmm. So Arlo, how do you get started with getting teams to be agile? Um, well, so the first step is cultural. Um, team has to own its destiny. Um, and so for that, there needs to be a team. Um, I find usually the, the main obstacle is that we don't actually have a team. Uh, people call it a team. Um, it consists of 60 or 80 or 150 people um, that each one is allocated to multiple feature crews working on each, a different crew for each feature that they're working on, four or five in flight per developer at a time, and it's a horrible mess. Right. Uh, there is no team. Right? So the first step is to actually just get teams to exist. Um, I usually do that by using uh, the power of the hierarchy um, and uh, <laughs> All right. the last authoritarian decision that will be made is to create the teams that will take over. <laughs> it's sort of the, the opposite of, you know, voting yourself out of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. First, the queen says that we will have parliament and parliamentary rules established. <laughs> um, so yeah, I do that. Um, and then once we've got teams and, and real teams, single assignment like we need, um, then it's about getting those teams to own their destiny. Um, and getting them to own their destiny, they need to start controlling their code, they need to start controlling their process, their practices, um, their interactions with each other, with their customers, everything. Um, and so that's where we start with refactoring. And I teach people to do little changes to their, their culture, little changes to their process, and little changes to their code. And that's the, that's the so there's just two that's, steps? It's, well, okay, so that's day one, right? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So day one, day one, uh, it's it's uh, uh, a team's gonna get together. We're gonna talk about retrospectives. They're gonna have a little bit of a mini chartering. They're gonna start doing some retrospectives. Um, they're gonna start pair programming for a couple hours a day. They're going to um, do some refactoring, probably on some legacy code. Um, but it's not you know, full in depth on all of these. I want to teach people extract method and, and hmm. introduce parameter and introduce variables so that we can just get started and no further than that, right? So with each one of these things, it's get started on a set of things that support each other um, and start to see some results fairly quickly. Um, but then once we've got that, there will be thousands of days of uh, one more new improvement every day on until they finally learn, you know, everything there is to learn. All right. So if we go back to the first step to actually get a team, getting a team, yeah. So and you say that you have lots of people and they're spread across features. Yeah, mess. So, yep. Yeah. So and then you say uh, you by management decree we now have teams. How does that work? I mean. It seems so <laughs> magic. Oh uh, well, yeah. Okay, it is a little magic. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, typically, when I'm going into an engagement, um, the first thing that I need to establish is, are they actually going to be capable of change? Um, and so I go in and I talk to the champions of the engagement, whoever those are, which typically include management, but it's not entirely management, um, and establish, you know, what is the compelling business reason that is sufficient that you're actually going to make a change? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for many businesses, they don't know that. Um, but they can identify one or two pain points, and so I have a process to work through. Once we've established a compelling business reason, um, then all of those champions are fully aligned that, yeah, we have to solve this problem. So they're willing to start executing changes. Uh, and as soon as they're willing to start executing changes, I can just say, okay, well, then here's the, the engagement that we, that we offer, and here's the prereqs. And one of those prereqs is single assignment teams with uh, cross-functional of about eight people. <laughs> so, so single assignment team, cross-functional, about eight people. That's, yep. that's the definition of a team that you can start work with. Right. And do they accept that? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so at that point, they know, they know what they want to get out of it. They know they need to get it. Um, and that's a prereq to getting there. And they can see why it's a prereq. So, all right, they'll do it. All right. And then you come to the, um, you go on and you teach them some technical practices. Start and, with the tech, yep. So you start with the tech. Yeah. And you said you start with the four basic refactorings? Yeah, four basic refactorings. Um, uh, extract method, introduce variable, introduce parameter, and rename. All right. Um, the goal is uh, with just those four, you can start introducing names. Um, and we can start teaching the great names. So um, uh, those uh, are 
kind of the things that you want developers to have in their fingers. Mm -hmm. Do you work on any particular platforms or tools that uh, support refactoring, or do you teach manual refactoring? Well, uh, whenever possible, C-sharp. Uh, <laughs> and then life is easy and fun. Um, and otherwise, yeah, when I'm in JavaScript or C++, then I have to teach the manual process. Um, I keep hoping that someday someone will finish a tool that does refactoring in C++. So you do find that the tool support there is important for teams to get. Oh, it's a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, I find that uh, the speed of, of uh, uptake, um, the probability of success, um, the degree of productivity, the, the decrease in bug rate, all of these are dramatically determined by whether there's a refactoring tool. And uh, you only need to really know those four refactorings to start getting better. Right. You need those four for day one. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the first set of things that I'm teaching people are local refactoring, and it's starting to be able to take chunks of code that are messy and nasty and legacy, bad legacy, um, and get them um, a little more intelligible and a little lower complexity. And so those four are the first four. Once people have that, they can handle many problems, and then one at a time, you know, one or two days between, they'll run into a problem that can't be solved with a refactor, and they know. Mm -hmm. And they have the cheat sheet, and they go look it up. Right. So then it becomes self-directed. Right. And uh, so after a while, by focusing on refactoring, you said that the team will ma master their destiny? Was that how you... Own their destiny. Own their destiny, yes. Yes. Uh, with refactoring on the code and with uh, uh, pairing and retrospectives for uh, team formation. So how do you introduce pairing? Um, it's another prereq. Um, so we talk about the value of, uh, of the various things. Um, and, and we actually have multiple different engagement styles. So the one that I'm talking about is the full-on immersion one. Um, there are lesser ones that if people aren't going to do the things that are going to make work, well, we will do a much lesser investment and they will get a less, much lesser result. Right. Um, <laughs> and that's okay, that's their choice, right? Um, but if people are, are gonna do the work, then, uh, then we ask, you know, so pairing is an interesting part of it. And, you know, do you have problems with, or wanna control the rate of learning on the team? Um, uh, the rate of uh, uh, you know, discipline, um, and productivity, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, habit formation. Habit formation. Formation, yeah. So uh, how long does it take me to change a habit? Mm -hmm. If we decide that we're going to now um, always write the tests first, right. how long until we always do? Right. Um, if we're pairing all day, then it doesn't take very long. And if we're not pairing, it takes a really long time. Uh -huh. um, so, <laughs> so it is an enabling practice in that sense. It's all an enabling practice. Um, and I talk about why you use it, and that it enables, and then uh, um, people sign up for it. And they usually sign up for two hours a day. Some of them will sign up for all day. So uh, you ask the developers on the team to sign up for how much they want to pair? Um, usually I ask, again, that, that starting group that's the champions. Yeah. Um, and so that consists of a bunch of IC developers and some man leads and some managers, um, and that group makes the call. Um, it, uh, since those people are representative of pretty much all of the voices in the group, um, most people then say, all right, whatever, we'll, we'll join on in. <laughs> so um, we've talked about uh, refactoring and uh, test room, uh, sorry, about pairing, but we haven't talked much about test room development. No. Um, so there was a statement, uh, I don't remember who said it, but in 10 years, uh, a developer who doesn't know TDD will be unemployable. How do you, what do you think about that statement? Um, I think it's, you know, that's likely true um, in much the way that a, a developer who all they know is COBOL uh, is no longer employable. That's not to say that you can't write good programs in COBOL, right? right. Uh, you can write just fine without TDD. Um, TDD is, uh, it's going to become a, you know, sort of a baseline. Uh, it's not what actually drives bugs out of the system or results in quality. Refactoring is what does that. TDD is the stand-in that has gotten the credit and that's the easy one to point to. I can easily identify whether someone is unit testing. It's much harder to, te to look at their code and say, did they refactor? Hmm. Right. But aren't refactoring very dangerous if you don't test? Um, no, uh, as long as you're using the rigorous approaches. The point of refactoring is that you can statically analyze and demonstrate that you know it is bug for bug compatible in the code. It doesn't matter whether there's a test there or not. Now, if what you're doing is local rewrites uh, instead of refactoring, 
then yeah, that's dangerous as hell. You, you can't do that without test coverage, but <laughs> you don't do that, right? I don't rewrite my code, I mechanically refactor it. Um, and I mean, mechanical refactorings are how you get legacy code to the point where you can put tests around it. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't afford to introduce a bug during that process, so I have to do something that's completely safe in the nastiest, gnarliest code that we have then you know what? It's also safe in the not-so-nasty gnarly <laughs> code that you get later. Um, I, that said, I do still teach unit testing. I do still teach test first. Um, but I teach it later and for a different purpose. Right. So test first is to start learning to use tests as spec. And the whole point of that is to teach people vertical decomposition and to break the, t the spec down into a smaller chunk. Um, and Now you know, we're getting into requirement space, I think. Or tech requirements, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're we're not now. Now we're moving into sort of a user engagement or customer engagement part of it. At least a little bit. People draw more distinctions in these yes. than I do. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm assuming pairing, right? So it might be that the pair that's doing the the tests is a PM and a dev, or a tester and a dev, or you know, whatever, mm -hmm. um, and it's a little more spec-like. But I mean, really, it's that uh, as you're going, you're recording one little more goal that you want to achieve, or one little piece of thinking that you want to try out, and then you go and meet it. Um, and that's not necessarily about requirements. It's not necessarily about tech. It could be about anything. It's it's one more thing I want to try. Right. So what you're saying is that when you get that basic fluency, so you're no longer afraid of your code, right? then you can start doing experiments and then then you can decide where those experiments will take you based on your context. Yeah. And, and so the tests become the recording of experiments that I've run. Yeah. Um, but the experiments are primarily actually, d I'm doing refactoring, so I'm learning stuff there and then I'm just recording things out into the tests. Um, all right, so um, what's so when we got that covered, mm -hmm. what's the mm -hmm. next step for a team? Well, so uh, so the thing is that uh, many people talk about uh, bringing on the practices, you know, a, a practice at a time, or do you do it all at once? Um, my perspective is each one of these practices is actually longitudinal in nature. Um, they are. Uh, it takes you twenty minutes to learn to do the basics of it, and it's. It's because it's actually a thousand different practices. Yeah. You know? And so it takes you 20 minutes to learn the first case. Right? And then you will learn those cases over forever. So I'm bringing in all the practices at once, the first couple of cases of each. And then the next two years are learning all the other cases of every single one of those practices. Mm. Um, and so it takes about three to six months to the point where you're really pretty competent at development and are able to start driving the, co the uh, uh, tech debt down, and then it takes about another 18 months while you're paying off the accrued debt from before, um, and that's the first two years or so. Right. Um, now, all of the stuff that we've been talking about is focusing on the engineering practices, how mm -hmm. to get that better, and that, that, that takes a while, especially if you want to move your existing code base mm -hmm. to a better place. Mm -hmm. um, when, uh, when you go to an Agile conference these days, it seems like most of the talks are not about engineering. They're about um, strategy or uh, product uh, management or discovery and this sort of stuff. How does that play? Yeah, so if we look at the fluency model, um, we see uh, you know, there, there's a bunch of one-star talks. They're talking about Scrum primarily. Um, They're talking about how we do the management of our team and how we get to align teams. That's the way I think of it. It's one star is an aligned team. So. I recommend talking in terms of stories and great that helps get alignment and alignment with the customer goal. You know, fine, good stuff, whatever. Then two star, <laughs> everyone ignores and forgets about being effective at actually executing and delivering. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the people who haven't figured that out yet or seen that it is important are talking about one star stuff. The people who have seen it as important mostly have figured it out and they're now talking about three star stuff. And so three star, we're starting to look at um, building the right thing and learning customer need and uh, discovering strategies and all of that sort of stuff. And that's where people are playing. So in the conferences right now, we see a split where the community that is able to execute assumes execution and is building on it. Mm -hmm. And the, the group that is not able to execute assumes that execution is just like traditional with similar bug rates and whatever. And so they're talking about how you build systems that can account for the failures that are a necessary part of software development. So there's a whole like 
there's a big hole there where people have moved on and, and we've got half of the people still believe that bugs are normal, half of the believe that people believe that bugs are an option and they've chosen not to have them. Hmm. Right. <laughs> uh, but uh, isn't it more important to do the right thing than to do the thing right? Uh, let's look at the risks of software development. Right. So if you look at a, a, a given feature, um, teams that are picking them by the usual, which is opinion of the, the high, most highly paid person in the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, when you do that, that person usually has a fairly good clue, and, and as a result, they're uh, right about a third of the time, and it adds positive value. Um, and it loses value about a third of the time, and it has no change about a third of the time. Um, and a given feature, so it's, you know, it's evenly spread. Okay. Um, however, uh, when you look at execution, um, the number of projects which are, which are able to make it uh, to their market window with the features that they needed in order to be successful in the market is about a third. Um, and the other ones are either they miss the market window or they miss the execution. So it mm -hmm. seems like risk is about the same between execution and uh, build, the, uh, uh, build the right thing, right. except the first one was per feature. When you add more features, you get regression to the mean. And it tends to be that the high value features have uh, super linear uh, exponential return. Oh, right. yes. So you get a, a preponderance of those. Also, at the low end, you have exponential decay, but they're so bad, they're freaking obvious, so you know them in beta and you remove them. And the result is that over time, as you have a large number of features, you do have positive value. So even if you go with the opinion of the highest paid person in the room, your product will have positive value. Not as good as it could, but it will have positive value. Right. Whereas, no matter how you go, only a third of your projects are even going to make it off the springboard. So your biggest risk to software development is actually shipping the product at all. If you ship it, it will have some value. Now, once you have eliminated the risk of execution and paid that down, then now you're at a state where you've got about a 100% chance of, of hitting the market window with, your, with what you want. Yeah. Um, but you've still got this random distribution of features. Now I see where to make my next improvement, right? <laughs> so, so your biggest risk is actually in building shipping. it right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that also gives you the opportunity to gather the feedback. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for the lightning round? Got my spoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, what's your favorite programming language? Minions. <laughs> Minions? Minions. I'm writing it. So. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first step that I should take to become a better developer? <laughs> Refactor more. <laughs> uh, and what's the first refactoring I should work on? Uh, extract method. Uh, what's your favorite uh, kata, coding kata? Uh, Gilded Rose. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what is Gilded Rose? Uh, it's a refactoring kata. Uh, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a ricotta, or it's a kata that's about uh, three screens long of text is all, um, that has most of the traits of a legacy code system in those three screens. Um, and uh, your job is to just add one more little feature um, that uh, will require you to either do a whole lot of special casing and get things under a tremendous amount of test or refactor it to a same point and then you can move on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure.